Good. Um, so yeah, Proverbs chapter 11. That's where we are. We, we are at today. Two ways to live. You know, there's one way, a way that may seem right, but, but leads to death. But another way, you know, which people shun, but it's really the way of life. Or as Jesus would say, uh, there's a way that is broad, that, that road, that path that leads to destruction, that leads to hell. But then there's the narrow way, which many do not follow, but the many follow that broad way, which leads to hell. We are now in chapter 11, but before we get into that, you, you understand the hyena. Uh, I think the hyena is one of those uh, animals in our African folklore, in our African stories, in our proverbs, there's a lot that goes for hyena. And I can assure you, whenever we talk about the hyena, a lot of it, uh, you know, a lot of it is warning. It is warning. A lot of it is nothing good. Of course, Kenyans come up with so many things, you know, want to glorify the bad. Uh, Tim Mafisi and all that kind of thing. But still, it's a bad thing. It's, it's not like something to be glorified or something you want to be proud of or to be associated of. But anyway, I'm, I'm sure we all know, uh, you know, this, this story about the hyena who, you know, smells, gets this very nice smell and starts following it, you know, to know why it leads. Because the hyena wants to eat, the hyena wants food, so follows the smell, follows the smell. Then, lo and behold, the hyena comes at a crossroads, kunanjia panda. And at the, you know, the back of the hyena, the, on the back of the minds of the hyena is, I really need that food. That is all I want. My desire, I'm salivating for that food. But here I am, yet here I am at a crossroads. Which road will lead me to that? Instead of choosing one road to follow, the hyena just decides to try and work things out to follow both roads. And we all know the story, you know? Hyena mushoe, fisi ya kafanya nini, kapasuka msamba. It didn't go well with the hyena. And when we look at the book of Proverbs, I think in, in a very interesting way, in a very big way, Rather than just saying, you know, we choose one over the other, I think in many instances, how we try to live, it's almost like the hyena. We see the warning is so clear. We see the call of wisdom is so clear. We hear it and we admire. We want, we want what wisdom is offering us. But at the end of the day, we are also hearing the voice of the other woman fully. Folly, foolishness. And in the end, rather than even just being wanting to choose one, we end up at this crossroads. One foot we want to put on the way of wisdom and another foot we still want to put in the way of folly. And the results are disastrous. In the end, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. There has to be one way. It's either A or B. It's either wisdom or folly. There's no middle ground. There's no following a path that we ourselves create. Now, Proverbs 11, it's already been read for us, but here is the summary. Proverbs 11, there's the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. Which one will you follow? There is the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. Which one will you follow? And that's a big question for you tonight. That's a big question for me tonight. As you continue looking at the book of Proverbs, as you continue thinking about this book, you know, right there we have a choice before us. Right there, we, we've got this question staring right in our eyes, right in our face. This path, these two paths have been presented to us. Which one are we going to follow? You know, and our, my desire, my prayer is that as we hear the word, let the entrance of the word make us really wise. Let the entrance of the word really be that light to our path that will help us to really choose the path of wisdom. Proverbs 11, there is a way 
There's the way of the righteous and there's the way of the wicked. Which one will you follow? Three things we'll look at. Number one, which is from verse 1 to 7. Way of the righteous versus way of the wicked. The first thing, way of the righteous versus way of the wicked. Let me just read that again from verse 1 to 7. A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with the humble is wisdom. The integrity of the upright guides them, but the crookedness of the treacherous destroys them. Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. The righteousness of the blameless keeps his way straight. But the wicked falls by his own wickedness. The righteousness of the upright delivers them, but the treacherous are taken captive by their lust. When the wicked dies, his hope will perish, and the expectation of, the we of wealth perishes too. Verse 8, the righteous is delivered from trouble, and the wicked walks into it. It's up to verse 8 actually, not verse 7. Look at the two stark differences there. There's righteousness, there is wickedness. These first eight, eight verses filled with that complete total contrast, total opposite, opposites. It's like a stark day and night. The, difference are very, the differences are very clear. You cannot confuse one for the other. It's like day and night, darkness and light. It's all black and white. There's no gray area in there. On one hand, there is righteousness. On the other hand, there is darkness it starts by mentioning false balances versus just uh, just wait a false balance is an abomination to the lord but i just wait is his delight and again those who do false balances are the are the, the wicked but those who use just wait are the delight again for god's people in the old testament this was a big thing you do not steal from your fellow by you know using false uh, balances, you know, so that the scale looks like they are tilted when what is on the other side is less than what is on this other side. People, you, people, you know, uh, altering the scales so that things fall in their favor. You think you bought one, kilo, one kg of, of beef, but actually what you've gone away with is three quarters of beef, you know. You think you've got the right weight, but actually you reach home, you realize, no, it doesn't add up. The Lord says that false balance is an abomination. Those are two ways there. You can choose either the way of false balance or using just weight. Righteousness or wickedness. Again, it's very clear there in these verses. Look at the way they have been mentioned quite a number of times. Almost, you know, put side by side. Righteousness on one hand wickedness on the other and righteousness here is really right living uh, that's essentially what it means here uh, for god's people in the in the old testament and actually for us is the way of life are you living right as you stand before god are you living right in the eyes of the law are you a person who is obeying the law of god and this is seen in the relationships you have with god with man and with the rest of creation based on the law and as we know, the law can be divided into two, love God and love man. So being right is you are living, you are in, in the right standing before God and also in the right standing before other people. So there are all those, there, there are all those stark differences. For the righteous, look at the results of righteousness. Verse 3, the integrity of the upright guides them. So there's guidance for those who are upright, those who are righteous. But what about the crooked? What about the wicked? Well, their crookedness destroys them. Again, crookedness there is going against God's order. You know, when something is crooked, something has bent, it is not f following the normal order. It has deviated from the straight line. So all the, crooked, the crookedness of the treacherous destroys them. On one hand, the righteousness will preserve them, will guide them, but crookedness of the treacherous destroys them. Verse 4, riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Again, there, one thing that is a reality there, or the day of wrath there, 
um, you know, just showing that there's a day that a day that is coming that before God, people will have to give an account of how they have lived their lives. And on that day when men and women and children stand before God, and the way they have lived their lives, either in righteousness or in wickedness, when they stand before God, it doesn't matter how rich one is, because verse 4, the riches will not profit in the day of wrath. And this is a very stark warning there we see in, in chapter 11. But there are other differences there. So one, there is wrath, you know, one will not stand. But on the other hand, one who is righteous will be delivered. For another one, verse 5, the righteousness of the blameless keeps his way straight. Walking in righteousness will keep your way straight. You follow the right path. But the wicked will fall by their own wickedness. Their path will not be straight, will be crooked to have all those potholes. Milima na mabonde. Verse 6, the righteousness of the upright delivers them, but the treacherous are taken captive by their lust. Whatever they are craving after, whatever they are burning with this desire, lusting after, it will take them captive. If it is the lust of their eyes and the flesh, the desire to, you know, get rich quick and all that. It will burn them, take hold of them, and they will not be able to kujinasua from that, uh, that matego, that snare they are in. Look at verse 7. When the wicked dies, his hope will perish, and the expectation of wealth perishes too. Like, you know, for the wicked, when they die, your hero, they, they are gone. There's no hope for them beyond even the grave. There's no hope for them. But what about the righteous? Verse 8, they will be delivered from trouble. So here, right before us, there's the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. And the question is, which way will you follow? Which one are you going to follow? Number two. One is way of the righteous and versus way of the wicked. Number two, words and their effects on community. Words and their effect on community. That's the second thing we see here from verse 9 and verse 9 and to verse 14. Let me read that again from verse 9 to 14. With his mouth, the godless man would destroy his neighbor. But by knowledge, the righteous are delivered. When it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices. And the, when the wicked perish, there are shouts of gladness. By the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted. But by the mouth of the wicked, it is overthrown. Whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense. But a man of understanding remains silent. Whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets. But he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps a thing covered. Verse 14. Where there is no guidance, a people falls. But in abundance of counselors. There is safety. Look at that. It's all about speech. Look at the words there that connotes, uh, you know, connotes speech or what we say with his mouth, verse 9. There mentions rejoicing, verse, verse, verse 10. But these are other people who are rejoicing as a, as an, a result of things going well with the righteous. And rejoicing, this will be, you see, now toward of course, but with, you know, ululation, so to say. Look at the end of verse 10. But when the wicked perish, there are shouts of gladness. This is something that is odd to us Africans, you know. In a way, when the wicked perish, there are shouts of gladness. Huh. Verse 11, by the blessing of the upright. Blessing. Again, this is a speech. that The upright speak blessing. They, they bless with their mouth, they speak blessing. The end of verse 11, but, but by the mouth of the wicked, it is overthrown. Again, the mouth there. Verse 12, whoever belittles his neighbor. Again, using the mouth and speaking there, belittling someone. But a man of understanding remains silent. On the other hand, the, the, the righteous, the man of understanding, doesn't speak unnecessarily. Then verse 13, there is slander. One goes about slandering. But another one keeps a thing and a thing covered, doesn't speak, doesn't reveal the secrets. Verse 14. Guidance. Where where there's no guidance, the people force. But then where 
there is abundance of counsel as the safety. Again, here counsel is, you know, and, and guidance is out of speech. It's spoken here. Uh, I don't think you can counsel someone when you're just quiet. You know, you're just quiet. You are not offering any guidance. But again, speech, all about speech here. And, and the big thing here is that words matter. Particularly and more so in the context of relationships, in community, words do matter. Words do matter. And there's a big difference in the way the righteous use their mouths and how the wicked use their mouths. There's a big difference here. For the wicked, for the ungodly, for the godless, their mouths are just used for destroying. They're just used for destroying. They speak their own things. But the godly, the righteous, they use their mouths to bless, to build up, to preserve, to speak blessing, to guide. That's what they do. They know when to speak. They know when to keep quiet. And here's the thing. I, 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 I don't know if we realize that words do really matter. Um, we, we need to realize that. You know, in many ways we think physical abuse is so bad. And, and it is. Physical abuse is, is really bad. But sometimes we really neglect just how bad also verbal abuse is. And uh, the emotional abuse that comes with that. It's such a bad thing. I don't know if you ever you've, you've had this experience of this con men who steal from you via M-Pesa and all those kind of things. So someone steals from you. You call them, they receive. And then one answer kutus. Man, that is even bad. It's worse than even kukuibia. Ongenibia tu ala kunyamazi. Lakini umenibia, you've stolen from me, I ask you, and then you start abusing me. It's even bad. It's even bad. Words matter. Words matter. Remember what James says? Uh, James says how, you know, the tongue is a small thing, but, you know, the effects of the tongue, they, they are like a wildfire. It's a very small thing. But like the radar that leads the sheep, or like that fire, the wildfire in the bush, it burns the whole thing. That's what the tongue does. And for wicked people, for godless people, it's like those people whose tongue has been let loose. For them, bad-mouthing other people is nothing. Speaking ill of other people is nothing. Brothers and sisters, think of the times you've been careless with words yourself. You know, I, I, how, how are you with words? Have you been careless with words? Have you spoken and hurt other people with words? Or think of it when people have been careless with words towards you. And how has that been? How has that gone? Maneno nimbaya, when used badly. It mentions here, verse 12, whoever belittles his neighbor. You know, verse 9, with his mouth a godless man would destroy his neighbor. It's about community. So it mentions neighbor, neighbor there. But also the city. Mentions verse 10. When it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices. And when the wicked perish, they are shouts of gladness. Verse 11. By the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted. But by the mouth of the wicked, it, that is the city, is overthrown. Verse 12. Belittles neighbor. Then we come to verse 13. Whoever goes about slandering, you know, verse 14, where there is no guidance, a people falls. It is kind of a whole nation, kind of. A people, peoples, nations. Neighbor, city, a whole people, a whole nation, a whole people group, a whole tribe, that kind of thing. And, and, and think of it this way. When you, when, you, when you think about gossip, you know, and slander, and the whole machine, you know, we engage in, we don't like people who engage in that. We don't like people 
who are gossiping about us or people slandering us. We don't like that. But of course we join in when we are talking about someone else. But brothers and sisters, words, we need to be very careful. We need to be wise how we use our words. Because how we use the, our words, it will prove whether we are being godly or we're just being godless. You know, with words, are they giving counsel? Verse 14. Are they bringing in guidance? Are we being on the part of the abundance of counselors? Or ours is just, you know, speaking and speaking and speaking. Words build or destroy community. Words build or destroy community. Again, which one are you going to choose? How you use your words? Are you going to choose the way that builds a community or the way that destroys community? I think just something I saw which very was very helpful when going through the book of Galatians. When you come to Galatians chapter 5 and it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, and someone helped me just to see that actually the fruit of the Spirit, all those things that are mentioned there, those things are in the line of relationship. It is in the light of community. You cannot be on your own and say, oh yeah, I'm bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Oh, I'm so loving, I'm so kind, that kind of thing. Wait until you are put before people and realize how unloving, how unkind you are. And words expose all these things in a very big way. Words and the effects on the community. Which way are you going to choose? Is it the way of the righteous, which causes rejoicing? which is the way of blessing and blesses, which really brings counsel, or the all the wicked which belittles others, which destroys neighbors, which brings uproar, which brings slander and gossip and malice. Which way are you going to choose? And number three, which is our last one, is wealth. If we've seen way of righteous and versus way of wicked, number two is Words, but number three is wealth. Wealth, let righteousness guide you. So wealth from, you know, the rest of the chapter really from verse 15 to 31, it, all, it, it talks about wealth. Let me just again read through uh, quite uh, fast and then we'll see. Uh, so from verse 15, whoever puts up security for a stranger will surely suffer harm. But you who had striking hands in pledge is secure. A gracious woman gets honor, and violent men get riches. A man who is kind benefits himself, but a cruel man hurts himself. The wicked earns deceptive wages, but one who sows righteousness gets a sure reward. Whoever is steadfast in righteousness will live, but he who pursues evil will die. Those of good, crooked heart are an abomination to the Lord, but those of blameless ways are his delight. Be assured, an evil person will not go unpunished. But the offspring of the righteous will be delivered. Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman without discretion. The desire of the righteous ends only in good, the expectation of the wicked in wrath. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and one who waters will himself be watered. The people curse him who holds back grain, but a blessing is on the hide of him who sells it. Whoever diligently seeks good seeks favor, but evil comes to him who searches for it. Whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. Whoever troubles his own household will inherit the wind, and the fool will be servant to the wise of heart. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And whoever captures souls is wise. If the righteous is repaid on earth, how much more the wicked and the sinner? So here's the thing. I think that in summary, what the writer is saying here is that you can get away, you can get wealth in whichever way you want. All you just need to do is just go for it, just do it. You can get wealth whichever way you want, you know. Like it says in verse 16, a gracious woman gets honor and a violent, man, a violent man gets riches. Just like, you know, there's the way of graciousness, like using the picture of a woman, who want to get honor, which again has to do with um, position and wealth. 
but also there's another way of the violent man to get riches. You can, you can choose whichever way you want. In other words, what the writer, again, let's not misunderstand here. What he's saying is presenting different scenarios, painting pictures of different scenarios here, which will, will, will apply to us in our lives at different circumstances, at different you know, levels of life as you go through. At one point, we'll need to apply this, verse 16. At one point, we'll need to apply perhaps verse 22, verse 23. Uh, this is how Proverbs work in this scenario, in this picture, presenting all these different scenarios, but speaking uh, that one message to us. So it's one thing, like an example again, verse 15. Is that guy who put up security for a stranger. You know, Labda, you're guaranteeing a stranger, someone who do not know, your money will be lost. But then there's one who doesn't secure, give security for someone who does not know. But look at verse 17. A man who is kind benefits himself, but a cruel man hurts himself. So he's saying, there's this way, there's this way. But then verse 17, he says, actually, there's one that will be benefit, of benefit to you. But another will not be of benefit to you. There are consequences. Whichever way one chooses to follow, whichever scheme one wants to get into, to get rich, to get wealth, they might eventually get wealthy. But in the end, is it worth it? Does it come, what, what result does it come with? Or what benefit is it? What are the consequences that one will face? And at the center of this, in, in, the, in the pursuit for wealth, in the desire to get wealth. I think at the center of this is that let righteousness be your guide. So from verse 19 to 21, whoever is steadfast in righteousness will live, but he who pursues evil will die. Again, this is not just evil, like evil out there, but evil in wealth creation, evil in making wealth, using all evil means to get wealth. Verse 20, those of crooked heart are an abomination to the Lord, but those of blameless ways are his delight. Again, crookedness, using all those, you know, crooked ways to acquire wealth, breaking all the boundaries without any limits. Verse 21, be assured, an evil person will not go unpunished, but the offspring of the righteous will be delivered. Again, evil in the way this person gets wealth. And then there's this very interesting, very strange verse, verse 22, and you wonder how it's coming in, in this context of wealth. Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman without discretion. Again, I think it's the whole point here. When you think of it in terms of wealth, in terms of things that uh, the value placed even on what you have, the possessions. So it might be wealth in itself is not bad. It's something very good. So from great to kind of uh, the, the worst case scenario here. So compare it, someone who is not godly, someone who is, you know, wicked, but they have a lot of wealth. Of what value is that to them? It is like that ring of gold on the, on the pig's snout. Oh, that beauty of a woman, but with no discretion, but with no wisdom, with no self-control, with no discernment. The same thing, wealth in the hands of wickedness. It's nothing. But we don't think of it this way. We think this is the best thing that can ever happen. We think this is the thing we want to have and fight for in a big way. But the writer of Proverbs is telling us, no, it's not like that. And then look at verse 24. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give. And only suffers want. And in, in a way, you can think being stingy may work now. Yeah, it may work now, being stingy and wanting for self, being, you know, selfish. But in the end, actually, generosity is king. Generosity triumphs. Generosity is the thing we should be seeking. Because being generous, the thing is, actually, you're not just doing for this, but actually, it is that which will last into eternity. It is that which will last into eternity, being, uh, being generous. So when, when he's saying here, um, you know, one gives really to gross all the richer. Yes, it may be in this life, materially, but I don't think it's necessarily just saying my growing richer materially. It growing richer in terms of the spiritual value to it. 
growing richer in terms of the being a blessing to the many people and the way the relationships with others are strengthened you know the way many are helped being richer in terms of actually helping those who are in need you know think of the way people you know when you are stingy how will people talk about you and how will people talk about you when you are someone who actually is generous someone who gives and i think that's the kind of thing that uh, that is there really rather than uh, just thinking of ah uh, it will it will bring all the results right now and all that it's more than just even the material benefit but all round all round how people talk about you how people are satisfied you know spiritually how jesus himself says you know you're you, you you're putting um your wealth your treasure where moth and rust cannot eat that's what generosity does that's what generosity does but look at verse i want us to finish by looking at verse 24 25 again emphasizing this very point uh, verse 24 25 already read verse 24 one gives freely as yet grows all the richer another withholds what he should give and only suffers want verse 25 what brings blessing will be enriched and one who waters will himself be watered you know as you do to others again you know it comes to you abundantly as you do to others it's not like it will be taken away for you also will be replenished and refreshed verse 28 to 30 whoever trusts in his riches will fall but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf whoever troubles his own household will inherit the wind and the fool will be servant to the wise of heart the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and whoever captures souls is wise at the end of the day the righteous really are not just concerned about wealth yes they might get wealth as they go along as they do things but at the end of the day actually for them is the inheritance the fruit is the tree of life it's more than just in what materially they get materially what they seek in the end is actually life itself but what about those who's their own aim the one and only aim is to seek riches and wealth verse 28 they will fall and their end will be their riches that they seek after and so at the end of the day righteousness still triumphs righteousness should be our guide honoring to please the lord honoring to do everything in light of being in good standing before god and before man doing what is right that should be our guide rather than just doing it and the way you know we say fake it till you make it or the way we just want to you know a daily grind every day we have to to, to get it by you know hook or crook whichever way I, I don't know what is your approach to wealth i don't know what's your approach to and your old view as far as wealth and uh, wealth creation and you know prosperity is concerned which way are you following are you thinking well righteousness should be my guide or for you the wealth itself the prosperity is the end goal that is all you want it will not benefit it will not benefit the end of it all let's apply this three things just in line with what you've said one practice righteousness we've seen just the value of righteousness here and and that's the way to follow righteousness practice righteousness for us who believe us we know our right standing before god justification being righteous before god we are given by jesus the one who died on the cross for us that when we believe in jesus when we say by grace through faith what what happens is that jesus covers us with his own righteousness he takes our filth you know he takes our our own even efforts our own righteousness our own works which don't merit before god he takes them and what he does he gives us his own righteousness clothes us with their own righteousness but once we are clothed with righteousness then we ought to practice righteousness to keep doing that which is right before god 1 john chapter 3 verse 10 by this it is evident who are the children of god and who are the children of the devil whoever does not practice righteousness is not of god nor is the one who does not love his brother ours is to practice righteousness 
and to love one another. That is how we prove that we are children of God. Number two, use your words to bless. Use your words to bless. Words are powerful. Words affect community. They build or destroy community. And there's a warning from James chapter 3, verse 10. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, these things ought not to be so. We should use our mouth to bless, not to use them to bless and curse. We should know just how to use our mouth. We should know how to treat other people. What we say, and as Paul writes in Ephesians 4, we should put off the old nature. We should put off the works of the flesh and put on the new, the new self. And number three, don't be a slave to wealth. Be righteous. Don't be a slave to wealth. Be righteous. Don't be caught up in the pursuit for wealth such that you don't think about honoring God. You don't think about other people. You tramp over other people, you know, who are familiar. Use them as a ladder for you to get whatever you want. Be righteous. Jeremiah 9, 23-24. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For all these things I delight, declares the Lord. What does the Lord delight in? He does not delight in our boasting in our wisdom, our boasting in our might, our boasting in riches, but that we understand and we know him. We know his steadfast love. We know his justice, his righteousness. That's what the Lord, at the end of the day, will delight in. That's what will matter. That is what matters and ultimately will matter before the Lord. So brothers and sisters, which way are you going to live? Practice righteousness. Use your words to bless. Don't be a slave to work. Be righteous. Let me end there. There was a something I was to do at the end, but because of time we'll have to do it later. Let me finish there. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight. Thank you for your word. And when we hear these words, we are rebuked because in many ways we are not those who follow the way of the righteous. We are caught in between. We, we think we can try and follow both. Lord, have mercy on us. Help us as you have redeemed us and saved us to live as those who have been redeemed and saved. And if there is any among us who has not yet been redeemed, who is not saved, I pray that, Lord, would you be at work in them by your spirit bringing them to you and helping them to follow that right way, the way that leads to life and not following the way that leads to death. So help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Kida, for uh, helping us see those uh, three things from uh, that uh, proverb, proverb chapter 11, uh, use of our words. Yeah, and uh, our choice for righteousness so we can see and also that uh, full application from uh, that uh, chapter that we ought to be not uh, practicing righteousness who are not slaves to wealth but by using our words to bless and not to practice our wickedness to curse other people and to send them